I rewatched the last video two weeks later and hated it. Usually when I rewatch a video, there's a hundred little things I dislike, but this was probably the worst. It went a bit too fast for me, even though I wrote it and was pretty boring. In this video, I'm going to try make up for it by re-explaining some things people found confusing and answer the homework. First, I want to re-explain the essential idea of the last video in a more compact and abstract way. I think it might make it easier. Feel free to skip this though. If you had your wave function in terms of some variable x, then if you measured x, you just use the Born rule to find out the probability of each of these states. This doesn't show any interference between these states. In other words, it looks just like the particle was in one of those states all along and we just didn't know which. However, this isn't really the case, and we can tell if we measure another thing, let's call it y. We can tell because of this. If we had a particle that really was in state x1, or really a bunch of particles in that state, and we measure y, we can find out the probability that we measure it in state y1 or y2, etc. Then we can do the same thing with particles in state x2, etc. But our original particle was in a superposition state. So if I really thought that it was in just one of these states with probabilities from the coefficients, I'd write it like this. Now you can use your high school probability theory to work out what the probabilities are when you measure y. So how about pause the video and work out the probability that the particle will be in state y1 when measured. Also, what does quantum mechanics predict? So the answer is, you add up the probabilities of each of these branches, and so you get this. However, this is not what you get if you really did the experiment, and it's not what quantum mechanics predicts. That's because in quantum mechanics, the particle really is in a superposition of all of these at the same time, and so each of these interfere with each other, giving you a different result. Okay, so now we're ready to answer the first homework question. Explain how this interference is the same thing as the interference in the double slit experiment. There are a few ways you can answer this, all valid. But in particular, I want to show why the interference in both cases is the same thing from a completely mathematical standpoint. What is observable x in the double slit experiment? This might surprise you, but it's which door the particle goes through. You may be thinking that that's not an observable, but it is because remember you can measure it by putting detectors at the doors. A particle is in a superposition of all possible x values it could have. In this case, it's a superposition of going through door 1 and 2. If I measure which door, there is no interference. It just looks like the particle really was just going through one door. But we know that that isn't the case, and we can show it by measuring something else instead. The observable y is where the particle lands on the far wall. We know that if the particle goes through one door, it lands somewhere behind that door. So if we believe that it really only went through one door, but we just didn't know which, we'd expect two blobs behind each door. Of course, that's not what we get. In other words, we got interference. Well, that was probably boring as hell, but I really wanted to spell out that connection. Hopefully you're interested in why the interference pattern looks like that. That's something I'll explain in a video soon. For that, you need to convert the wave function from x to y, in this case, from being in terms of which slit to what position it lands. That's very closely related to how you go from a wave function in terms of position to one in terms of speed or momentum. By the way, can I introduce a piece of jargon here? We call this process a change of basis. Here, it's changing from the position basis to the momentum basis. If a wave function is written, let's say, in terms of spin up and down, we say it's written in the spin up down basis. Remember, we can write the wave function in any basis we want. We can tell a wave function is written in a particular basis if these states are eigenstates of that observable. Remember, eigenstate is a term I briefly mentioned last time rather quickly. What it means is, if I measure, say, position, 
an eigenstate of position is a particular position. Or if I measure spin up downness, I can only get up or down, so each of these are eigenstates. So for any observable x, an eigenstate is a possible value you can get when you measure that observable. Really, there is no need for this term, but it makes physicists happy, so sometimes I'll use it. Getting back to the homework, the next question was, what has any of this got to do with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? So here's my chance to use the term eigenstate a lot. Say a particle is an eigenstate of an observable x. In other words, it really is just in one x state. If x was positioned, that would mean it really is just in one place. No matter how many times you measure it, it will still be there. So you have no uncertainty about its x value. But now we want to know the uncertainty we have about some other variable y, let's say speed or momentum. How can we find out? We change basis. We rewrite this x eigenstate into a y one. Now, say it looks like this. This means that if I measure y, there are all these values it can be, and so there is an uncertainty about my value of y. And so it's not possible to have no uncertainty about x and y for the same particle. Later on, we'll go further and find that often, if there's a little uncertainty about x, there has to be a fair bit of uncertainty about y, and vice versa. Next question. This one was about hidden variables. Does this interference stuff mean that hidden variables are impossible? The answer is no, and let me take the double slit experiment as an example of why not. Remember, hidden variable theories want to say a particle really does only do one thing at a time and isn't in a superposition. They can do this if they're clever about it. The particle can go through just one door, but it has to know that the other door is open and it has to change its behavior accordingly. Something like Bohmian mechanics does just that, and you can prove mathematically that that theory will give you exactly the same results as quantum mechanics. But you see, both theories are really weird. Bohmian mechanics is by no means classical. Okay, so homework is over, and this is already way longer than I'd like, but I figure you'll leave if you're bored. The last thing I want to do is a request to redo a calculation from the last video. Remember, I asked you what would happen if I measure this particle, a superposition of up and down, in terms of left and right instead. By the way, I've decided that I'll explain what spin up and down and everything means physically in the next video, because that was requested a lot. Anyway, in case you're interested, this is how people answered the question. To start, we need to remember how to convert from up-down eigenstates to left-right. So far, I've just stated this as a rule. It says, whenever you see up, you can change basis by replacing it with right plus left. And whenever you see down, you can replace it with a right minus left. So in our case, we have this. And so we change basis by replacing this up and down. All that's left at this point is expanding these brackets and then collecting terms. These two right eigenstates are constructive. The left eigenstates are opposite signs, and so they're destructive. In the end, we just get that up plus down equals right. I encourage you to try up minus down, and you should get left. OK, so here's the cool thing. We know how to change basis from up down to left right, but now we can change basis the other way. If I have a state like this in the left-right basis, I can now use the previous result and replace that left and right. This video was actually okay to make. I managed to write the script in about four hours instead of four straight days of agony. I think I'll try to do this more often.